At 8.30 that morning, you had firehouses filled with firemen talking about the same thing that you spoke about to your colleagues at work today. At 8.47, everything changed. And these firefighters that went in there did not know that they were going into a war. That wasn't in the game plan when they got off those fire trucks. They were going to put out a fire. The attacks on the World Trade Center towers on September 11, 2001, tested emergency responders well beyond their limits of experience and imagination. As the first 911 calls poured in, New York City firefighters, police, and emergency personnel, whether on duty or off, rushed to Lower Manhattan. Unaware of the impending collapse of both World Trade Center towers, their sole focus was rescue. As first responders searched for and evacuated victims, the intense heat rapidly distorted and weakened the massive steel giant. Within hours, emergency and support personnel across the nation and the world responded to New York's call for help. It would become the greatest rescue and recovery mission in the nation's history. The World Trade Center complex encompassed 16 acres and contained seven high-rise buildings, including the World Trade Center towers. Home to hundreds of international businesses, the Twin Towers were icons of economic success and symbols for New York City and its famous skyline. Ran north on Easy Street, you could feel the heat in the dust cloud. Just after the towers collapsed, casualty estimates were in the tens of thousands. I knew I couldn't outrun it, so I dove into a police command vehicle into the bus. Debris and dust. <laughs> Conditions are unreal. Five, five, ten, four. The command post is in trouble. We have people trapped in the building on the first floor. We got buried alive. That became our graveyard. The force of the explosion, whatever was on the street, just sealed off any way to get out. We basically took our last breath and Lieutenant Tim again from the New York Police Department was able to get to a handgun he had. Put the handgun up against the one window that we were trying to get in. The next thing I remember hearing is pop, pop, pop. At that point, all we knew, we had air again. We didn't know what was going on. We couldn't see anything. The building was completely blackened out. You couldn't see the sun, nothing. It looked like a tornado, a war. It, it looked very surrealistic. The ground started shaking again. And I basically looked up at the sky and said, oh my God, here we go again. I grabbed my partner and tucked her underneath me, brought her to the ground. The debris really got bad coming in. Then it was a deadly silence, very deadly, deadly silence. I was thinking I have to get the people together and start getting communications together and see what we have to do to go in to create an operation, what's needed to do a rescue. That was what's on my mind. Joseph Morris, retired chief of the Port Authority Police Department, is no stranger to disaster. Having responded to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, Morris was well aware of the importance of command strategy as he assumed command of the Trade Center disaster. You know, you're gathering what, you, what resources you have, what we lost and what you have. And, you know, I hate to say it, but what, I was more looking what I had, not what I lost. EMS Captain Carolyn Fioranti and her husband John, an EMT, arrived at a staging area on the Brooklyn side of the Battery Tunnel. 
A gentleman came up to me, a paramedic, and said, you are the only boss here. I had 40 ambulances and no idea what was on the other side of the tunnel. Send every available ambulance to World Trade Center. Once we realized that there was nobody on the other side really coming out, we took the 40 ambulances that we had and we went into the tunnel and we went into the city. And when we came out of the tunnel and saw the chief of the department standing there directing traffic, we knew at that point there was no command post, there was no order, there was a lot of chaos. You looked up and you said, okay, this used to be South Tower. You look at this pile and I'm going, okay, this isn't safe. We get over the West Street and now you see this row of ambulances. No one's with them. And I remember going through Rescue Five's truck, taking their oxygen and their stretchers and, and their bags. And we came out and there was a fire chief outside. And I felt like, oh my God, you know, I'm stealing this guy's equipment. And he goes, no, no, take what you need. And I said, where is everybody? And he goes, they're all gone. They were destroyed, they were running on a shoestring, and they were still getting it done. You knew you were going. The firefighters all over the nation knew they were going. It was beyond obligation, it was just, it was a call. It was a call, it was a call. Click, 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 I'm in New York, you know? And I'm heading for, uh, I'm headed for, I'm headed for the, uh, <laughs> the worst place on earth. My brother, Glenn Winnick, was an attorney, partner in the law firm Holland and Knight, located a block and a half from Ground Zero. Uh, but for almost 20 years, he was a volunteer firefighter and an EMT. When the towers were hit that morning, Glenn helped in the evacuation of the Holland and Knight offices at 195 Broadway and borrowed a mask and glove and a first response medic bag and raced towards what had been the South Tower. I mean, this is what he was about and what firemen are about. They, they're not like you and me. They run towards danger. It's in their blood. It's what they do. Joseph Higgins, an FDNY veteran, reached the northwest edge of the disaster site with fellow firefighters. And it went from a beautiful, beautiful sunny day to looking like the middle of the night in a complete war zone. We couldn't believe what we were looking at. We didn't know where we were going. We were just trying to find a spot where we could maybe do some good. From Spanish Harlem, over 100 blocks north, a group of firefighters led by FDNY Lieutenant John McColl rushed toward the perimeter. Firemen coming up, covered with white, you know. I mean, we didn't know what the white was. I, I couldn't for the life of me figure out what it was. For about two blocks above Stuyvesant, we started seeing the debris, the dust and the papers, and it got deeper and deeper. As you walked through it, it was like walking through the snow. It got so high. For firefighter Joe Higgins, the rescue effort took on special significance. And uh, I knew my brother was in that building, but the problem was I didn't know if my other brothers were in that building also at the time, neither, and they didn't know if I was in there at the time either. So it was kind of like nerve-wracking, but at the same time, you were just trying to get something done. With many of New York's most seasoned rescue personnel missing in the collapses, dozens of experienced emergency personnel took the initiative of breaking workers into teams to begin search and rescue. There was a lack of tools and there was no water pressure. I remember we were trying to hook up to a towel ladder to get water on a fire on a couple of buildings that were on fire on Church Street. We tried to find World Trade Center 1. See, nobody knew where anything was. It was so unrecognizable. And we're trying to get in through an impenetrable wall of steel and eye beams and plaster and then we made our way across this it took us about 20 minutes to get across West Street we gathered with all the other guys up on top of a big perch like where all the steel had kind of like come to a big hill when you got out there you could see what the hell happened like oh my god like the amount of devastation was really apparent now because you could see as far as you could see, was nothing but steel. 
And then we did eventually come around to west side, the west side where we thought we had a good spot where we could maybe start working our way in and start searching for victims. And then we finally got a broad look at everything. That's when it struck me that all this time we've been searching, we're still in the street. We didn't even make it to where the buildings are yet. There was a guy on the sixth floor waving a handkerchief out the window when I had gotten there. And I was like, how the hell are we going to get this guy out? He's up on the sixth floor. I followed up and did a search of the, the fourth floor. Didn't find anybody, but there was a lot of fire up there, possibilities of people being trapped. It was like everybody had just left. It was bottles of water, cups of coffee, everything covered with ash. We get to the back and all of a sudden, whoa, there's no more floor. It's like, just gives way to nothing. My guys took that guy down. He was the head of customs. He was the head customs officer in New York. And he was guarding the, uh, the contraband, all the drugs and the guns and whatever the cops and FBI find. And uh, I could tell you, he was, I think he was from Texas, because any New Yorker would have not stayed up there. I don't care who they were. Adding to the incredible level of danger and chaos, all high-rise buildings surrounding the complex were severely damaged and in danger of collapse, forcing fire commanders to order Higgins and nearly a thousand other emergency personnel out of the disaster site. And then at that time, they decided, everybody out, everybody out. Everybody and uh, we've just been evacuated. There's been multiple bomb threats down there as well as a secondary collapse of what was remaining of the six floors of the uh, South Tower. So pretty much everybody's been pulled out of there now until everything's done. Other than that, it's just a mess. It's absolutely unbelievable. Although each minute away from the site would likely mean more loss of life, until the all clear sounded, there was nothing emergency workers could do but watch and wait. From the Battery to Harlem, New York streets were filled with chaos. Friends and strangers crying, clutching, comforting each other. Groups gathered at storefronts watching TV coverage and the stunned look of disbelief on upward turned faces. We all thought that 10,000 people just died. So when the second, second building fell, uh, I, I came back to the West Side uh, Highway and the refugees are starting to come. And the thing that stays with me is people walking in the street. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people. And the women, a lot of them, they were walking um, without their shoes. People were, were fleeing larger buildings because they were afraid that the attacks would continue. On the city's east side, citizens and workers sought to escape the horror by making their way on foot across bridges into Brooklyn and Queens. Below them, the harbor rescue began to take place. The fire boat was coming in, and then the circle line came in, and private boats came in, and everybody was getting onto boats to get off the island. And it was like Dunkirk originally, with the people being evacuated by the men of the harbor. And there was just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that were just showing up. And where do you start? With maritime precision, dozens of boats immediately began evacuations along the Hudson River. Coast Guard cutters, tugboats, ferries, and official vessels, as well as huge sightseeing ships like the Spirit of New York, ferried thousands to the safety of Jersey City's waterfront. I put 600 people on this boat. I can have them loaded in about 10 minutes. They're massive people movers. We moved uh, just under 20,000 people in four hours, just with four boats. Across the country, people had an overwhelming desire to do something, anything. The bar behind us has been kind enough. They have about 30, 40 cases of water, Gatorade, and these ladies here have been kind enough to feed us. 
Arroz con gandule, pollo frito, ensalada. Tens of thousands began to make their way to Ground Zero. Not certain how to help, but desperate to restore order. It's just like worker bees. There was just, just, just a frenzy of activity of people wanting to help out, wanting to give out. Thousands of New Yorkers searched for locations where they could volunteer. It was a spiritual commitment, you know, to this country and to my fellow firefighters and fellow Americans. It's just, you gotta go. You don't have a choice. I couldn't believe that someone would do this to, to our city. And, uh, and then I thought that, well, it's my obligation, my responsibility to, to go out and to help. Lisa Orloff, a New York fashion designer, came upon a line of volunteers. I went from what seemed like a second of helping at that line to two seconds in helping a Salvation Army canteen organize their food to three seconds of helping a doctor create kits and for uh, volunteer medical people to go down to ground zero. Determined to find a way to contribute, Tobin Mueller, a Greenwich Village composer and playwright, made his way down the West Side Highway to Chelsea Piers. There were a lineup of about 30 ambulances down West Side and about seven or eight ambulances down 17th Street. And there was a, a steady stream where they would go down to ground zero. And outside of this little mobile home was one table. And on the table was a platter of donuts and one, one thing of, uh, of coffee. From a single coffee dispenser, Tobin's small contribution quickly grew into a full-fledged disaster supply operation. And because we were as far as you could go to the south on West Side Highway, people would walk and they couldn't get any farther. They would walk with things that they had heard from the television that they needed. There were New Yorkers all along there, you know, coming with stuff that they wanted to actually contribute. And, uh, Barbara and I went over to, we went to the Chelsea Piers. We were donating some uh, t-shirts and socks and stuff that they were asking for the guys. And about three hours into this, when we had really a ton of stuff, uh, I talked to the dispatcher fellow and said, is there any way that, that we can get this to the people that need it? Uh, we, we, we are running out of room here. And so he talked to the harbor police. And that's how we, f we had our first shipment that would go into the back of the harbor at Ground Zero. And, and that began our communication then directly with the firemen uh, that were at Ground Zero. The, the firemen started calling us the, the Home Depot because this was where they could come and find things. And we had a, just a bank of people whose jobs was to call and ask for donations. And it was really as if you could go and knock on any door and say, do you have this? And people would find it and bring it to you. There was just a tremendous outpouring of assistance of helping behavior, both on the part of official responders and on the part of volunteers coming to help and giving donations. The collapse of the World Trade Center towers set in motion a historic and heroic response from rescue personnel in surrounding cities and states. In the Long Island community of Freeport, Ladder One was among the first dispatched. We have a very large and very active department here, and we, have, uh, we take training very seriously, and we're known for that. There was a call made to Freeport, and uh, there was a request specifically for a team that was trained in collapse and technical rescue. When we arrived at the scene, there was uh, concerns with respect to number seven World Trade Center because it had been compromised so greatly, they were kind of keeping people away from that area. So we were detailed to help just north of the site to try to clear out the debris so that they could start bringing in equipment that was the cash that would come in from the urban search and rescue teams. After the initial collapses and the really serious injuries and the modern injuries were treated, it was just what occurred during the day and there was mostly exhaustion, dehydration, eyes, asthma. We were one block over from where the tower used to be. We had set up a makeshift morgue, and mainly what we treated that day were firefighters. Normally our job is to treat people and get into the hospital. Here you were treating release, and yeah. we're not used to that. You're not used to it, but 
just wasn't an everyday occurrence. Seven World Trade Center did eventually collapse. It came down so quietly. And we were standing right next to it at one point earlier in the day. So I guess that turned out to be a pretty good move because there would have been a lot more loss of life. Shortly after that, we went back to work. Firefighters and rescue personnel have come to expect the unexpected. But nothing could have prepared them for what they saw. I can remember, like it was yesterday, walking down these streets and it was dark because it was probably 5.30, 6 o'clock, but with all the, the smoke and the dust and everything still, it really masked any sunlight that might have been existing. It looked like a movie set. That's the best way I can describe it. Lower Manhattan streets, normally bustling with life, had become deserted and desolate. The entire area below 14th Street, blocked off by police barricades and heavily guarded, had been declared a crime scene. There was an incredible groundswell of support that came from all over the country to try to assist New York in getting their feet back on the ground. People did not come there wondering if they were going to get paid. They came there to help. And that's the way we all felt. Uh, we just had to be here. I had to go down. There was no stopping me. I, I needed to be down there. I needed to be down there. And so I took the actions and I got down there. It seemed to be a lot of construction workers going down to volunteer. And I hopped on one of the trucks to go down and help out. And it was amazing to see how all of the guys and girls down there, knowing that there was a, a job to be done without really any supervision, combination of everybody, the firemen, the police, the construction workers, the people that gave out coffee, it was just about, let's get it done. You have really this important role of emergent groups and volunteers um, who are not affiliated with an official response. We really see how important their role is. Many volunteer rescuers worked side by side with career rescue workers. Kenny Sheehan, a crew member for The Late Show with David Letterman, had significant construction experience. Greg Gerson, a composer and former drummer for Billy Idol, had valuable welding skills. Jeff Johns was part of the Transit Authority's emergency unit. The way the steel was laying, the way the overpasses were hanging, they couldn't get equipment in, and it was all pretty much done by hand, digging by hand, so it just took a lot of manpower. You know, they would just say, well, we need 50 guys over here, and then we'd jump from different parts of the pile to do whatever we could do to move stuff. Some parts of the pile were almost six stories high. I mean, you're talking about debris, a mountain of debris, a just jagged mess. It was the most dangerous place. I remember the first thing was you couldn't believe it. You just couldn't believe it. It, it, it was beyond the scope of imagination. It wasn't a building, it wasn't two buildings, it, it was blocks. Walking was almost impossible. There's no road map. You were making it as you went. Your eyes never stopped looking. That's all you did was look. With all the steel and intertwined, a shovel would just bounce off of one piece. If it hits one piece of steel, it's just going to bounce off. The only way to do it was to force your hands down under there and lift it up and put it in a bucket. That's how most of the buckets were filled. The most dangerous job site I've ever seen in my life. Da just danger everywhere. But uh, below your feet was the reason you were there. I felt like I was in the color part of the Wizard of Oz until we popped up through the tunnel and went into Ground Zero because it became black. 
if you could make a video of what you perceive hell to look like from fire shooting up at times, that's what would happen. You would be in the middle of what would look like steel and then fire just would pop up. Firemen were coming out with an iron worker with their boots literally melted. And then the hose would come over and they would try to put that part out. We were at a rescue mode at that time. Everybody there thought we were going to rescue firemen and people in the building. That's all we thought. They would stick their probes down to find any type of shaft or path through the steel. As rescuers continued to search, they found that office areas, once 10 feet tall, had been compressed into spaces barely large enough to reach into with a flashlight. You know, the hopes were that people were down in large tunnels through the steel. The most sophisticated rescue equipment available was employed during the search. The bucket brigade, as we called it, with you know, the, the firemen going into the center of the pile with five-gallon buckets, literally moving dirt by the spoonful so they wouldn't go in with heavy equipment and hurt anybody that could be still surviving. There were no direct orders, no one person or group in command. Those in the bucket lines were solemn and intently focused. You would find yourself moving further and further up, around, and down in to the, uh, the center of, uh, of what used to be the towers. We made it to the absolute front. There was usually about four or five, maybe even six guys. That was the circle of digging, that was the circle of prying, of ripping, of cutting. And when you, when you got there to the front, you didn't want to leave. I mean, you're there. If, you, if you're going to make a difference, that's the place to be. So you stayed there as long as you possibly could. And for me, I, I stayed there until my hands didn't work anymore. And then when it was the next day, we were right back there at the crack of dawn. And we got to really see what we saw the next day. We could not believe what we were looking at. We couldn't believe it. The massive disaster site, now covering over 30 acres, or double the World Trade Complex size, was divided into four sectors, each with its own command post. Uh, you had the firemen, with the bucket brigades trying to find survivors. And then you had the rescue dogs going below the steel. The dog's role at ground zero was just essential. There's just no other way to do it. The dog's were it. Bob Yarnell, head of the American Canine Association, worked side by side with dozens of volunteer canine search and rescue teams arriving from across the country and the world to assist in the search. Heather Nostein, age 20 at the time, was the youngest member of these volunteer teams. We used them to find people because what they did was, just like they think I have a treat right now, they'd use those scent particles to find where the people were. And it's almost like colored smoke coming out of the ground to them. There wasn't any type of uh, mechanical device that you could use, like you're looking for metal as a metal detector. It was, it was the dogs. Though it was very difficult for us as the handlers, the body parts to them glowed in the dark. And they would just go boom, 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 and they'd find it right away. We could read their facial expressions really easily. Um, because they actually have all the muscles in their face to actually smile or to frown. So we knew what they were thinking when they were thinking it. The Rottweilers, she could give hand signals uh, from 200 feet away, and they would stop. And, and you had to be able to tell them to stop when you saw the heavy equipment coming in. The, the, the lady from Ohio Task Force 1 was probably about 4 foot 10. And to see this little woman, small woman, climbing over steel with her animal, which she loved like a family member, to get in there to try to help other people is, uh, I mean, it's just, they're, they're prepared for the ultimate sacrifice. They, they weren't worried about themselves. 
and there was no safe path to get to the middle of the World Trade Center. These dogs would be put in a harness and put a, a long rope on them, a tagline, and they let the dog go. The thing that we had to worry about the most was unstable ground, because it's a huge pile of rubble. You had to have radar the whole time, not just for yourself, but for the dog. The strain on everyone's face, and then we'd walk in, and they'd look down to see the dogs, and they would smile right away, or they would just start to clap. They got to perform their function, not just finding people, but helping people in all ways. They were just, they were incredible at all times. Given the massive size of the steel beams and other debris, the use of heavy construction equipment was essential. There was some big stuff, you know, big stuff had to be moved, and until they got cranes in to actually move stuff, it was, it was hard because it was all being done by hand. We were asked to get the biggest equipment we could to reach the furthest out and to start picking off steel beams. Well, when we first got there, of course, there was a lot of chaos. We had to make sure there wasn't another catastrophe because we were working on top of subways and concourses. And it was a very eerie, spooky kind of night, if you would, because um, there was still rumor that the building next to the Twin Towers was coming down. We would start to put the crane together and things would fall and, you know, everybody would start running for cover again. And it took us approximately eight hours to erect it and be ready to go to work. And we'd start working with so many iron workers at that time. Every piece of steel that we could get to, they were throwing steel chokers around them, hooking the crane, burning the beams, and throwing the beams out of the way to get further and further down in the hole. And iron workers, you think of the guys climbing up on the steel on the high rises trying to make a living. And they weren't worried about making a living, they were worried about trying to find other people. It was like being in combat down there without being fired on, really being on, under fire. That's what it was like. infantry front line. We had to get in there and burn so that they could get in further. We had to go in and cut so they could get in to the structure. Some parts of the pile were almost six stories high. I mean, you're talking about debris, a mountain of debris, a just jagged mess. There was parts of this structure that were hanging by thread we'd climb into these cages and if the crane would drop us in so we could start disassembling areas that were really gnarly and possibly going to break down so that so fire and police were, were not going to get hit. It was the most dangerous place you could imagine it and if you're up on the pile one mistake and you're dead. You're dead. I never saw one guy, not one guy say no. Every group worked with one group. It was complete cooperation throughout the whole site. It was like this unconditional commitment to make a difference. And I saw people doing it. I saw it. I was witness to it. There was a bonding there. If you could burn, burn. If you could run lines, run lines. Whatever had to be done, guys jumped up to do that. And, you know, it was amazing to see how guys that didn't know each other could work together so well. At one point, I was up on the man lift, and I looked over, and I could see just the devastation. I remember, I, I really remember this too, it was vivid. I looked over at my, my partner, and I just said, I said, look at these amazing people.
I mean, stop for a second, Charlie, look. We looked and I, I just, I felt the presence of a, of a higher power. I really did. Thousands of workers continued to search and dig 24 hours a day, bombarded by the incessant noise of the generator's buzz. At night, they were bathed in a wash of bright movie lights, blurring the distinction between day and night. Working the pile, it came to be called by those who were there. The thing about the rescue workers is that they would work non-stop around the clock and you couldn't get them to stop working. So you actually had to come bring the guy food so that he could eat. They were just not going to stop and he knew by watching them that they were not going to stop until they could find survivors. You know, a lot of these men, they were so exhausted and they were so hungry, but they were looking for their brothers. When they, we'd see them coming down, we'd just lead them, here, here's some water. Here, sit down here. Some of them were crying. I was just there and I would hold their hands, you know. We knew as a group that all of their attention had to be on finding their comrades. We didn't want any attention on where am I going to get some food, where can I lay down, where can I sit down. Uh, that was our job. There was a firefighter who his, his boots had completely worn off to nothing and he was digging in the rubble in his bare feet and I went and I ran him a new pair of boots. Even though there were different groups there, all of the groups were working together as a group to make sure that all of their needs and all were taken care of because they were doing something so much greater than we could possibly do out there. These volunteers, absolutely without question, were, were to, to help and to, to assist, to give. It was all about how can we help you do what you have to do better? How can we make your life easier so that you can accomplish what you need to accomplish? Dozens of Red Cross vehicles lined the surrounding streets, supplying drinks and snacks to the hundreds of workers who would arrive at the site each hour. As a volunteer first responder, Carlos Varon helped coordinate the faith-based Salvation Army's efforts to supply hot meals for the workers on the pile. So we were very fortunate that we had the amount of staff and, and people who um, were not EDS normally, emergency disaster services, but they were there because they had a calling. And the goal was to put volunteers with canteens, with experienced people, and even at times it was a matter of on-the-job training. The Harbors Maritime community rallied with their own unique type of aid. Our galleys are designed to feed you know, 600 to 1,000 people in about an hour's time. And that was when the idea for us started, like, listen, there's food out there, there's supplies out there, we've got a mobile piece of equipment, we can get supplied through the seawall. You know, the formation started to happen. With the help of New York restaurateurs, Captain Hank Rao converted the spirit of New York into a floating refuge. We had enough collected, and we figured we'll have 20,000 portions of food, and that should last us three days. We wound up doing between 800 and 1,000 portions of food per hour. I could not believe that there was that many people there. Corporate and private donations poured in with an unprecedented speed. Whatever was needed or wanted, every effort was made to find it and bring it to the site. What do you need? was the most common question asked by support volunteers and then echoed through the ever-present media. And got a bunch of brand new sweatshirts donated from the Gap. And a promise of 6,000 masks from 3M. We had 200 pairs of waders down and in. Truckloads of, of, of just help, you know, gear, food, anything. Coming from little old ladies that all they could afford is to send a can of soup to big corporations. Uh, it was amazing, you know, just the outpouring of help and somebody had brought like 40 cartons of grapes 
and you go, oh my God, it's a lot of grapes. <laughs> They're gonna go bad here. Somebody should make wine out of them. <laughs> Susan Vitti, an EMTN nursing student, became known throughout Ground Zero as the Entenmann's lady. Believe me, I filled my car. I mean, I opened up the boxes of the breakfast bars that were individually wrapped and I stuffed them into my glove compartment. Susan's work was one of the most unique of the volunteer efforts, bringing carloads of donated baked goods, cakes, and donuts to the New Jersey-based corporation. Now, when I drove to Ground Zero, my, my purse, my pocketbook, was sitting on my lap because there was no other place in the car to put it. I mean, these boxes were hitting my front windshield. She had her own route, her own routine. It would really lighten up the, the situation. It was really like a highlight for them. And that meant a lot to me. Susan VT brought cheer to the workers, clear through until the final day of the recovery operation. Although I love and respect all the workers at Ground Zero, uh, the PAPD, the night shift crew, they were like family to me. And I took care of them like they were my, they were my family for a time. And uh, out of all the people, they're the ones that I miss the most. And I don't think those men will ever know how much they meant to me taking care of them. You know, I mean, they, they did call it the pile, but there were many, many huge you know, piles of debris, so to speak. Barbara Taylor, a scenic designer for The Late Show with David Letterman, worked for months at and around Ground Zero as a support volunteer. They had this crazy effort, and you know, just in terms of equipment and logistics and and difficulty, it was actually like some creepy ballet of of just machinery moving. Uh, we unloaded our truck, did our thing, and we were right at the corner of one of the piles where they were they were actually digging. It was kind of like a staging area for a lot of people. You see the thing smoldering, the dust, the dirt. It's very horrific wasn't very much talking. It was just like almost like a doomsday type atmosphere. You know, it just seems like everybody was focused on the pile and what other people were doing. If you, you know, if you weren't working on a pile, you were just sitting back watching the other guys and just focused on them. The disaster site took on its own rhythm, its own life. You could see it was like a mound. That's the only way I can describe it, a mound of debris. And there were people up there working, digging, some of them just using their hands. Verlene Cheeseborough provided support to the rescuers through her church group. When the firemen would come from the mound and the emergency workers would come from the mound, they would, you know, be, you could see that they were tired, but more than anything, they needed human contact. And so when they would come down, um, I remember some groups would go over it and just leave them. It was called the No-Do Zone, south of Canal Street and the west of Broadway. You, you literally didn't need any money because everything you were fed, you were clothed if you needed underwear, you needed gloves, boots. I had people because of the heat of the pile, they were, they were going through a pair of boots every two days. Nearly every New York restaurant donated and served food to Ground Zero's volunteers. Among them was a small Italian eatery, 10 blocks north of Ground Zero on Canal Street. He chose to keep his restaurant open 24 hours exclusively to serve the rescue workers. As it became more known that he was doing that, loads of suppliers would contribute the food and all of the supplies so that he could indeed just keep uh, rescue workers fed. Because it was 10, 15 blocks from the actual site, I think the people that could leave the site, it gave them a chance to come away from the site to have their meal or to have their break, and gave them a chance to just sort of get off the actual site and feel like, you know, there was some normalcy. And, you know, served an even greater uh, purpose than maybe they even realized or intended was that it gave them a visual and, and emotional break. Moored at North Cove, the spirit of New York 
gave workers a welcome break from the horror and the devastation that stood just a few hundred yards away. You could leave that, that crater or that pile and then go 300 yards and the buildings on the west side were okay. So you're kind of instantly being transported into a zone that is not devastated. And there was a group of firemen down there and one guy was an engineer from Fireball. He said to me, thank you very much for providing this respite for us because it means a lot to not be inside the zone looking at the pile, looking at the devastation, looking at the destruction, and to sit on a chair to look out at the sunset and be able to have a meal and get composed and then go back to work in the pile to resume searching for people. I was part of a group of people or a group of beings that were just working like a machine together. And no one needed instructions and no one needed directions. You just did what needed to be done at the moment and continued on. One of the few buildings undamaged in the disaster zone was St. Paul's Chapel. Many called it the church that didn't fall. Uh, the, the recovery effort, that, that operation um, at, at the World Trade Center site was a 24-hour operation, seven days a week. And so people were coming into St. Paul's 24 hours, seven days a week. People just bringing in pots of soup from home and things they cooked at home and they just set up little tables along the back of the church and you'd walk in and it was like a buffet line. It was like you were at a wedding. People just came out of their own uh, heartfelt desire, their wanting, their longing. They had a need to do something. Clergy was everywhere. Every form of clergy could be found and could be found easily. And I think that helped. A lot. You know what, I don't think it helped. I know it helped. I know it helped a lot. And so around 11 o'clock at night, while the lights were dimmed, just soft music would be resounding throughout the, the chapel. I mean, you could walk into the chapel at 3 o'clock in the morning and hear soft music. And then people would just fall asleep. They would literally stretch out on the, on the pews. And I think we truly understood um, the importance, the ministry of presence, of just listening. Food and drink will carry that person, so, but that person wants to talk to somebody. That person may want to just open up and, and, and feel their anguish, feel uh, their sorrow, feel whatever it is. It wasn't that they needed mental health. What they needed was spiritual health and spiritual guidance. You do what we do. Sometimes you can't talk to the people that are closest to you. But if it's somebody who's a stranger, you can just let loose. It was all of that coming together, which really set a tone. It set a place for people to feel uh, comforted, uh, to feel cared for, to feel uh, loved. It was like kind of a recovery center. You go in and, and there was just banners and posters made from around the country. It wasn't just the food or the people. But we cannot underestimate the place, the sanctuary. And you'd walk into the church, and it was an amazing feeling in the church, and I told him this. It felt like, to me, every soul, everybody that was lost that day, their soul was in that church. A lot of the rescue workers would go there, and you would take solace in it. At Ground Zero, after um, the buildings came down, there was a, uh, a lot of hope, and that hope lasted for a really, really long time. And it was important to have that hope because that's what drove everybody that was on that pile at Ground Zero to try to locate somebody that might, might have been able to survive this, uh, this disaster. We were feverishly trying to get as much done as we could, but so little was being done because it was devastation. There wasn't one thing that resembled an office building, and this was the biggest office building in the world. Everything was metal, dust, concrete. That's it. It didn't stop me from looking, you know. I looked to the best I could, you know. I was down and climbing through those voids. I was down 30, 40 feet down in there, like, like tunnels, you know, on and went on and on and on. And then we started finding the brothers, and, uh, you know, we were humbled. It was a foxhole mentality. I was very proud of all the guys that stuck it out and, 
they did what they had to do, but we all were hoping for miracles too, you know? A couple of dead firemen we found in the street. They were there underneath the steel. You couldn't get them out. He's laying there and he's somebody's father. It was very frustrating. You know, you gotta hold on to hope. You know, you, you dream in your head that maybe there's a pocket, maybe they're down there and they're all chatting with each other waiting for us to come and get them. You watch these guys, their heads hanging down. You know what's going through their minds, but they're still after it, day in and day out after it. Surviving New York firefighters and emergency personnel felt certain that fate alone had prevented them from arriving first on the scene. Unable to rest even after the most grueling of stints, they would stay at the edge of the pile, watching, waiting, praying for a miracle. Although uh, we did everything we possibly could, it, it, it almost felt like a failure to us because, um, you know, we were done. We, we left no stone unturned. Force, the momentum of something like that, it's, it's like, what are the chances? There were none. Despite extraordinary effort and teamwork, both above the rubble and below, there had been no more rescues. There are family members out there that don't know if I don't go back in there. I didn't want to disappoint them. I didn't want to disappoint myself. So you put your jacket back on and you go back in. Many rescuers developed a profound connection to Ground Zero and to their fellow workers. Some spoke of this place as sacred ground. It became a ritual that, as out-of-town volunteers were preparing to leave the site for home, operating engineers would arrange for a crane and bucket to take them above the field of debris. There they would hover over the pile for a few minutes and say their farewells. It was a sense of duty that we had begun a job, we, we had a responsibility, and we will see it to the end. And as long as there were thought to be remains, as long as it was thought that people were still unidentified, that they were willing and, and wanting to continue to look. But that was out of a sense of duty, a sense of responsibility. And uh, he was an extraordinary firefighter. When he was alive, I used to say this to folks, that that's the best fireman that's ever been on a New York City fire department. And that stuff is uh, started with my brother Tim in this quarters right here. If he didn't run towards it, he wouldn't be the Glenn that we knew. And that's probably the same thing that was being said by family members for all those who were part of the rescue effort. So to me, he's a great American. And he walked among giants that day. For the first time in the 28 years I lived in New York, people came together. And it's something that I never thought New York could do. When this happened, it was kind of like being sucker punched. It took the wind out of the city for about a nanosecond. And then New York just came right up and went right into action. It was like America at its best. It was, that, it was Americans at their best. It was just like the heart of America just opened up and just poured forth. But you're also seeing this unprecedented outpouring of compassion from every corner of the globe. I think the rest of the world can look at New York and, and just like I look at what went on down here in, in complete awe of how it was done and it's it's something I think that this whole city and everybody that took part in this, including the people that died, can be very, very proud of. On September 11, 2001, Officer John Soltis was a recent retiree from the Port Authority Police Department. But as events unfolded, Soltis wasn't content with remaining at home watching news coverage on TV. Had I had 
had to have sit at home for um, those nine months and watch the news and call up and find out if they found anybody today, I would have, um, I would have gone crazy. On September 12th, he returned to service as part of a 12-man ad hoc task force made up entirely of retired PAPD officers. The uh, retired guys that came down to the site shortly after 9-11 um, and volunteered their time uh, were eventually formed into a rescue recovery team. The team was quickly dubbed Rescue Romeo. Well, we were all retired police officers, roughly in our 50s. After about two weeks, it became apparent that um, there were no more survivors. Uh, that's when we all sat down and we decided, you know what, these people who died, in particular um, our brothers, our 37 brothers and sisters who died, the very least that we can do, if we can't bring them home to their families alive, then we'll, we'll stick it out and bring them home to their families. And, uh, we all decided right then and there we're going we're gonna to stay till the bitter end. There wasn't a piece of rubble that left that pit that wasn't gone over with a fine-tooth comb. When you found someone, it was almost, to me, it was like a religious experience. When you walked them up to the top of that hill and loaded them on an ambulance, it was like you, were, you got them out of hell and you delivered them to God. From our department of 37 uh, people that died, um, I'm so proud of them. It's, I, you know, I wish they could be here, but they, they were the ones that didn't make it out. When I come down the West Side Highway or even looking out here now, I can still see those towers. It's like an amputee when they get a leg cut off, you can still feel the leg well. I can look down on that plaza and see everything just the way it was. In the wake of the tragedy of September 11th, numerous task forces and committees have rallied to address problems related to the Trade Center response. So I think we need better coordination, we need better communication, we need to understand the nature of these events and how we as individuals, as organizations, can better prepare to respond to hazard events. Although some issues have been resolved, the question remains, is the nation better prepared to respond? If you ask me and a lot of the EMS people and a lot of PD, ask any of us, do you think it'll happen again? We say yes. We must learn about the terrorism end of this and the rescue operation and how do you deal with a tragedy. But more than that, the terrorists win if that's all that future generations learn about. They must learn about how this nation pulled together and demonstrated an unprecedented display of compassion and resourcefulness and expertise and charitable service. We may never see its like again, but it's not anything we should ever let go of. And it is the most important lesson to come out of 9-11. Oh, the beautiful for spacious skies. I mean, the most amazing thing about the job that I do and the people I do it with is that they'll give their life for strangers. I saw people coming together and working together in a way that I had never seen before, never read about before, never imagined. Really, when you're talking about people coming together to help each other, that was the epitome of it. America. Nobody knew each other, and everybody was a brother and a sister immediately. It didn't matter what department you worked for. It didn't matter anything, what rank you were. All that mattered is that we were all there together trying to do the same thing. America, America. The tragedy, in effect, uh, had had taken all bias and gotten gotten rid of it. It was just everybody getting together, pushing forward. I, I have never seen uh, people coming together like that. I never have. From sea to shining sea. Seeing the buildings fall and seeing that huge space where there was nothing anymore. Uh, it was such a huge hole in you. You, you couldn't stop.
because then that hole would fill you up. And, and that's, that's what volunteering enabled you to fill up, and, and enabled you to keep moving so that you didn't feel that. So, that, so that you could make it something bigger than the hole that was created. In closing, we want to tell the tale of a simple yet very powerful volunteer act which stood out for those who reflected upon their days at Ground Zero. There were all these people lining the roads, screaming, cheering, waving flags, waving banners. Their contribution was to just stand on the highway and say, we know what you're doing and we appreciate it, I think was, was remarkable. I, you know, whatever time we were, came out, whatever time we came out, they were there. In the face of the nation's worst tragedy, even the smallest act of kindness spoke volumes. It always will. One key lesson 9-11 taught us is that no single group can effectively respond to a large-scale disaster. Coordination and teamwork among all groups and individuals is a necessity. Perhaps the most important lesson that we've learned is to acknowledge that the human spirit is composed of an incredibly deep well. If you really think about it, the only way to defeat terrorism is for all good people to join together and protect one another. We saw that at Ground Zero, and it's time to live by that example. Down to Earth Angel Everyday Hero You walk the wake of disaster Pitch your tents at ground zero When I was forced to face the unfaceable No hope in sight When I had lost the irreplaceable And day turned to night I didn't know you by name but here